So I'm going to talk about uh, NNG loss spectroscopy and particularly focusing on a bit of a tutorial first, and then also I'm going to give examples of uh, what you can do at really high spatial resolution. As Jerry mentioned, I have uh, wearing two hats, one as faculty member at McMaster University. Uh, in material science and engineering. I was the director, founder director of the Canadian Center for Electron Microscopy. And since uh, uh, 2019, middle 2019, I've been science director at the Canadian Light Source. Um, so both uh, facilities are on traditional territory. So I want to acknowledge uh, that uh, fact. Uh, for those of you not familiar with uh, um, McMaster University and the Canadian Light Source. Uh, just give a, a Google map here. Um, Saskatoon is located in the prairies. Uh, Hamilton is located on the westernmost tip of Lake Ontario, um, and both in Canada, obviously. And uh, McMaster University is the home of the Canadian Centre for Electron Microscopy, a facility that became operational in 2008. Uh, and uh, uh, Saskatoon is the home of the Canadian light source, uh, a land of extremes, a land of blue skies, but also a land of extremes. Uh, early February, we had minus 37. Actually, I think it peaked at minus 39, going down uh, go with a wind, fit, wind chill factor of minus 51, I think. Uh, I have that photo, but I didn't update it. And just last week, we, we were also hit by the this uh, heat cap. Uh, in Saskatoon, and that's the weather channel temperature <laughs> showing up there. Right, so before I get started on the scientific part, uh, I'll give a bit of a, an outline uh, what we're going to talk about, uh, a bit of background information on energy loss spectroscopy, then energy loss near structure, that's the interesting part, in particular how it compares to Xanes, uh, XAF and uh, some applications in oxides and uh, not necessarily special result but then i will i will give examples where we combine high energy resolution high spatial resolution and provide some outlook uh, depending on the time so we we do use high energy electrons for us high energy electrons are in the range of 30 to 300 kv um nothing compared to what is in a storage ring um but so we send these electrons onto a, a bulk sample. It can be a bulk sample in, in the case of scanning electron microscopy, but in the case of uh, transmission electron microscope, the sample needs to be sufficiently thin that electrons can go through. So it can be uh, a monolayer like graphene uh, or typically samples in the range of a uh, few tens to 100 of nanometers or so. And when the incident electron uh, hit the sample, there's a lot of signal generated. Uh, we're familiar with second, uh, a variety of electrons, secondary backscattered OJ, photons, um, and uh, also uh, if the sample is sufficiently thin, then we will have transmitted electrons, and there we have signals that can be uh, representing information from scat elastically scattered electrons, um, so no energy loss, so diffraction information, for example, and that was useful for imaging. Uh, but we can also have, uh, if you have a spectrometer, measure the energy that the inelastically scattered electrons have lost uh, when they go through the samples. And the difference here between elastic and, and inelastic scattered electron beside the energy loss is, uh, is the momentum transfer. So uh, this is a diagram. So we have an incident uh, wave vector and a final wave vector. And this, this is a scattering vector that defines the, uh, the process. And we will put an aperture uh, here in this diagram collecting these transmitted electrons. It can be a large aperture, it could be an aperture placed uh, somewhere off the transmitted uh, direction as well. Um, so that's a, a, a difference with what we would normally see in extra absorption where we don't have this momentum transfer. So if you look at uh, the excitation processes, we have a primary incident electron which excites uh, uh, electrons from core levels or uh, electrons from valence band uh, uh, to the unoccupied states uh, in general can come out as secondary electrons and then what we do measure is these uh, primary electrons that have gone through we measure their energy that is lost and then you obviously have the the excitation process through generation of photons or OJ electrons so that's uh, essentially uh, the difference. So instead of having incident electron, incident, uh, you would have photons in the case of X absorption. 
the nomenclature of the uh, edges, the ionization edges we see is the same as X-ray absorption. Depending on the core level, you would have the usual nomenclature that is uh, using X-ray absorption. Uh, so how we do this? We, we do this in an electron microscope, obviously. So we have an incident electron going through electron optics component, impinging on a sample. These electro and electronautical components would be used to focus down the electron beam or spread it out to form images in conventional imaging techniques. But for the purpose of our uh, presentation here, let's assume that we will, uh, when we really need to go to high spatial resolution, we'll focus the, the beam down to sub angstrom in the case of aberration corrected microscope. So we have a number of lenses, uh, the objective lens, the condenser mini lens, and uh, various detectors placed uh, post-specimen or even above the specimen if you want to collect photons generated by the primary uh, incident electrons. I show this picture of an old microscope. This is actually now 30 year old microscope. The reason why I show it is because uh, the newer microscope are actually mostly enclosed in a box. So you don't see uh, all the components, but essentially you put a sample in the middle of the column uh, obviously, everything is uh, ultra high vacuum uh, because of the use of electrons. Then the, the electrons go through. Then you have uh, images form on a viewing screen. And then spectrometer here is a magnetic prism. It's placed at the bottom of the microscope in, in most uh, uh, cases. There, there used to be all generation of microscope with an in column energy filter to disperse the electrons. So, because we have a uh, imaging uh, capabilities, we have uh, analytical signals, we can actually uh, do a lot of different experiments that provide information on structure. So this is what I mean by images. Uh, we can also obtain diffraction information, so Bragg's law with electrons, uh, very sensitive techniques uh, and useful and, and uh, very valuable, you know, take a picture and sometime it's good enough. Uh, but we can also get uh, chemical information with uh, the use of these detectors, X-ray detectors and energy loss spectrometers. And you can do a lot of different experiments uh, and uh, there are examples here. These are the techniques that are available, including electron energy loss spectroscopy, eye angle, under dark field, holography, tomography, etc., etc. So there are very specialized techniques. We could spend that, that entire tutorial covering one technique, but obviously we're going to focus on electron energy loss spectroscopy. Okay. Um, so before I give some practical aspects, uh, I should say that the these aberration correctors have really dramatically changed the impact of electron microscopy. So in the early 30s, the first electron microscope was demonstrated by Nolan Ruska. Ruska got the Nobel Prize. Uh, and the resolution, so the magnification, just for information, of the first electron microscope was four, OK? Uh, simply to prove the concept that we can actually use electrons to form images. Obviously, things evolved over the years. Uh, uh, there was a plateau in terms of resolution. So here you have this plot of resolution as a function of time. Um, and uh, in the 80s, uh, the trend was to start using high voltage microscope to decrease the wavelength of the electrons. In that case, improve the resolution according to uh, this equation here. And the, the resolution of the microscope was effectively limited not by the wavelength of uh, the, the particles, uh, but in fact, it was limited by the lens aberrations. So it, it's, uh, it's not a defect as, as such, it's just the the type of electric field, electromagnetic field in a lens that generates aberration. So you cannot have zero aberration in a round lens. So the development of aberration corrector just get, got around this uh, intrinsic limitation uh, and you went to higher order aberrations instead of just the, the simple spherical aberrations. And that uh, brought the, um, the resolution beyond the microscope with uh, what was called initially the Transmission Electron Aberration Corrector Microscope Project by the Department, the U.S. Department of Energy. And the first commercial microscope uh, came on the market in 2005. Um, and uh, that microscope combined uh, two uh, significant breakthroughs uh, that were developed over the period indicated there. Uh, 
these aberration corrector that also electron uh, monochromators to improve the resolution beyond what the uh, um, width intrinsic width of the electron source was typically around one EV uh, down to 0.3 EV if you had uh, cold field emission sources so instead of uh, uh, so this is a diagram also an interesting one showing the energy resolution and probe size so Initially, people focus on just trying to get uh, the best uh, imaging resolution, so a small probe uh, down to one angstrom, but, and then later on, the monochromators made it possible to start probing different type of um, uh, uh, phenomena, uh, um, so down to electronic structure information through energy loss near structure, uh, beyond the simply chemical mapping where the elements are and also uh, just uh, doing uh, uh, simple chemical mapping with uh, EDS techniques, for example. So the, this major breakthrough in around uh, 2008, I would say, combining um, monochromators and, and uh, aberration correctors gave us a resolution, an energy resolution of 0.1 electron volt uh, and a probe size below the angstrom level. So these are the what these gadgets look like. Uh, and we we got uh, actually number three in the world and McMaster combining the two instruments. I would say uh, amongst the these early system, the McMaster uh, microscope actually gave uh, the best uh, outcomes in terms of science. Um, it, it's so <laughs> this is to say that it's not always best to have the first model. It's good to have a model that is where you've sorted out the problems. Let's go into spectroscopy. So what is does an energy loss spectrum look like? Um, it's uh, well, it, it's shown here. It, this is a very early spectrum acquired with uh, what is called a serial spectrometer, so acquisition energy channel by energy channel, very long acquisitions. Uh, and what you can see here is uh, very significant is the dynamic range. So we have at zero energy loss, so you measure the incident electrons that have lost practically no energy. There's always a little bit, and the new microscope actually can discriminate the energy losses. Uh, within uh, milli electron volts. But let's say in normal condition, you have a zero loss peak, uh, so the incident electron practically, then uh, most, most intense losses come from excitation of valence electrons or so plasmons. And then you have these edges here, in, the, in this case, the mineral. And you notice what is important here is the dynamic range. So you have uh, several orders of magnitude signals that you have to be able to record. Uh, ideally on one detector, um, uh, and, in, and basically in the past, uh, basically you start acquiring spectra in different energy ranges uh, to get around that problem. But uh, today actually things have evolved so much that you can acquire this kind of spectra um, in, um, in, a, in a single shot. Uh, right, so where is the information coming from? If I look at the at energy diagram. So we have the excitations from the valence electrons, so these uh, intense features here, um, uh, plotted in a vertical energy loss scale. And then you have the core uh, electron transition. So you excite with an incident electron, you excite these uh, core electrons, and you will see the ionization edge here, the absorption edge equivalent in, in X absorption. And these two energy ranges provide different type of information. So at low energies, we have uh, we can measure optical properties, uh, the joint density of states, and then at high energy, you have information on chemical on the concentration of elements by measuring the intensities, but also chemical bonding environment. So we subdivide these edges uh, here. Are the features here, just like in extra absorption. Now in the energy loss near edge structures, and then the extended energy loss fine structures. And similar to X absorption, you have information on local coordination, valence state, uh, what, everything that I would call electronic structure in bonding environment. Uh, and I'll show examples of that uh, in the next few slides. And then the extended fine structures where you, again, you look at the modulation, you extract them and you can uh, retrieve the radial distribution function essentially the same as you can do with uh, x zanes or x apps as well uh, the difference there obviously is that uh, you can do this with uh, uh, an electron beam and therefore you can 
achieve uh, high spatial resolution. Um, so for those of not necessarily familiar, let's see if we can the slide. All right, I don't know what happened. So uh, brief uh, tutorial on uh, near its structure. Take the example of carbon. You have one S, two uh, S and two P electrons, six electrons. When you hybridize carbon atoms in sp2 configuration, we have pi and sigma uh, bonding and antibonding uh, orbitals. If you put these atoms together in a solid, you'd have the spreading of these uh, molecular orbitals into bands the occupied bands and the unoccupied bands. And then this energy loss spectrum uh, will be exactly the representation, more or less with these uh, um, core hole effects, obviously still into account of these uh, unoccupied states. And it's sensitive, just like uh, XAS, to the bonding environment. So in this case, we have carbon, sp2, and sp3 configurations uh, in, in uh, uh, carbon, uh, um, compounds, uh, in this case, some minerals. Um, so where you have carbon in uh, trigonal coordination. And then also you can see the uh, valence state uh, in the case of iron uh, L edges. Another example I like to show, and again, I have problems switching slides. I don't know why. Uh, titanium dioxide. Uh, so we have uh, the octahedral units, and uh, you have uh, when titanium dioxide, you have titanium 4 plus, uh, you have the titanium 3D, uh, 4S, and 4P states, all on unoccupied uh, molecular orbitals, the oxygen states. You put these, these molecular orbitals together, you have bonding and antibonding orbitals. You put them in a solid, and then you have bands, and what you see in the oxygen K spectrum. K spectrum, you will see these um, unoccupied states on the oxygen site uh, that have been excited. Uh, and you can do, uh, again, uh, fingerprinting, uh, simply simple interpretation, valence state, uh, uh, fractional valence, coordination, bonding, uh, information, spin state, just like uh, Zane's would be. And an example of uh, of this is uh, work we did uh, in early days with monochromators on ilmenites. Uh, these are minerals, at, uh, transition metal titanium oxide. So these are manganese, cobalt, iron, and nickel uh, ilmenites. Uh, and you can do um, energy loss, calculate, take energy loss spectra, really high energy resolution with these monochromators. And then you can do multiple calculation, providing a crystal field and spin state uh, and you can directly interpret the energy loss spectra. The other example is, uh, again, titanium dioxide in different uh, forms, anatase, brookite, brutile, uh, and then at the bottom here, yeah, perfect octahedra of uh, strontium titanate. Uh, another example I want to show is uh, the transition, uh, the metal insulator transition in this compound here, neodymium titanate. Uh, as you change the X composition of chemical formula, you add vacancies. And as a consequence of that, because uh, neodymium uh, remain, has maintains its uh, valence state, then you would have a metal to insulator transition going from titanium. It's affected, at least on, from a chemical point of view, titanium 3 plus to titanium 4 plus. Um, so what we did, we look at the oxygen K edge, uh, which I don't have time to discuss, but uh, we look at the titanium. Uh, L edge, and you can see as X changes uh, in this chemical formula, we have titanium typically of three plus and titanium four plus. And this is consistent with what you would see in extra absorption spectroscopy, not a different compound, but which has the same transition of valence state of titanium atom. So essentially we probe exactly the same type of information. Uh, for the purists, or those of you familiar with the details, uh, there are differences, though, uh, and I hinted them earlier on. So first, uh, well, we have the transition from core levels to the unoccupied states, but in the case of uh, extra absorption, you have a vertical transition. There's no uh, momentum transfer. So if you look at the, the, uh, these expressions here based on the Fermi's golden rule, 
instead of having the electric field here, we have the scattering vector here, Q, uh, which is significant. It's a di significant difference uh, when you want to take advantage of it. Uh, you don't, most of the time, you just forget about it. You get the same information, except when you, uh, you have anisotropic materials, then you do see the importance of considering this. Uh, again, for those of you a bit more familiar, so uh, the energy loss spectrum, um, there's an angular distribution, uh, and we essentially measure the imaginary part of one over minus one over epsilon, the dielectric function. And at high energies, uh, this is converted to epsilon two, which is the absorption part. So that's where the equivalence between yields and X absorption comes in. It's the absorption part at high energies. At low energy, obviously, because we have a uh, the screening is not very effective, but it is more effective of the valence electrons, then you have uh, a much more complex signal. And that's where you can deduce the dielectric function uh, from energy loss spectra. So, um, so uh, coming back to these uh, diagrams here, um, the difference is, so between extra absorption energy loss is the momentum transfer dependence uh, that replaces the electric field dependence. Um, so what does it mean in practice? Uh, so let's take the example of uh, graphite. Uh, it's an isotropic material. It's been studied with X absorption. The, the, the bonding dependent, the angular dependence has been studied just by looking at the different polarization of the electric field. In energy loss spectroscopy, because we can choose the collection angle, you remember in early slides I, I defined, I, I mentioned that we can collect the transmitted electrons and measure the energy loss with a small aperture, or you can move the aperture. You can also change the aperture. So if you look at the scattering vector here, if you select a small aperture, relatively small aperture, you will have uh, this momentum transfer vector almost in ideal infinitesimally small aperture, mostly forward scattered. Um, and then if you look at the graphite, then we will probe uh, uh, orbital or transition into states which have a component along that direction of the scattering vector. In this case, the pi star, because the, the, we have bonds between the planes. If you have a large aperture, so you, you increase the aperture of the spectrometer or basically decrease with op electron optical components the angular distribution, uh, or the, you demagnify the angular distribution. So you choose, you will have components of the scattering vector that are mostly parallel to the plane of the graphite. And this is shown in these two spectra. One is acquired with a large collection aperture, uh, collection aperture here. Uh, and you see the pi star peak very low compared to the sigma star. And then when you small, you change the aperture, make it very, very small, relatively small, you have the pi star, which is more intense because we probe more of these vertical transitions. Uh, of course, you still have, if you, if you have a very, very small aperture, what would happen then is they have mostly the, the pi star, but no sigma star or would be very weak. You still have some components because you do have a finite size of the aperture to collect signals. What does it mean? Uh, so if you, now, looking at the reciprocal space, this is a bit esoteric. So if you look at a reciprocal space, the angular distribution of scattering in reciprocal space at a given energy loss, then you can see the transition into these uh, uh, in, in reciprocal space. So let's say we take a, a diffraction pattern uh, on uh, just focusing on the transitions to the pi states and uh, another diffraction pattern we transition only on the sigma states here. And you choose the the orientation of the sample so that the symmetry is broken, you will see in reciprocal space, the transition in the pi star states in one direction. And if you just move a few electron volts, higher energy, you see transition in the sigma states. And the dot here in the center is actually the forward direction. So you do see the anisotropy in electron scattering in real space with your naked eyes, if you want. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, beautiful information. And I think here it's probably a good time to stop if there are any questions here. Yes, there are a few questions indeed. Um, I'll start off with one is um, uh, beam damage. So uh, uh, what in general can you tell us about that? And for example, what's your impression of the 
frequency of beam damage in eels, let's say, compared to soft X-ray microscopy? Uh, I think, I don't know who asked the question, but Adam is, is here. We did work together on the, on the comparison of eels and X-absorption, STIXM in particular. And uh, there are advantages in using soft X-rays. That's very clear. There's some sample where you just put the beam on it, the sample is gone. So, um, but actually it's not uh, as simple as that because it depends a lot on the incident energy, it depends on the, the type of material, the type of, of, of sample you're investigating and the type of damage induced by the electron beam. So I think Adam will be able to jump in. It's still a not, uh, not a clear cut um, uh, situation here. Uh, we, from experimental evidence, obviously it's easier to work with photons. There's not as much damage, but it's not um, as clear cut uh, in the case of, of using electrons, whether you, you induce some damage that is um, uh, definitely uh, um, happening, or you can avoid it by changing accelerating voltage, going to cryogenic condition and so on. Thank you. There was uh, another question asking about energy uh, stability of your energy scale over several hours. Uh, this is uh, used not to be very good, uh, but it's changed a lot now with feedback system. You can acquire spectra over, I would say, hours, and there's a, a sub EV uh, stability nowadays with the new instrument, particularly the new technology coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of you are familiar with uh, the neon microscopes. The feedback you can speed hours on on the same uh, few uh, uh, tens, uh, well fraction of, of an electron volt, uh, so that you you could acquire spectra of minutes, and you still have something like uh, five, ten milli electron volt energy mm -hmm. resolution. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, um, you showed us the dynamic structure factor, but not the the Rutherford cross section in front of it, the one over Q to the fourth. So in practice, um, how high an energy edge very, can you do uh, can you do spectroscopy on? Well, um, you can do you can measure Compton scattering. Uh, if you have these new detectors, uh, these uh, direct electron detectors, I think you you it is, it's not a limitation anymore. Uh, so there is a Q four factor dropping off, but. Um, I think it's not uh, something I would worry anymore now with these dielectric electron detector systems. Well, let's let, let, let's push the bounds. So, could you do copper K edge? That's nine kilovolt energy transfer. Uh, actually, there's recent work where they've done work at. Uh, uh, I think I don't remember which edge, but the, in the range of uh, 12, 15 kilo electron volts. Wow, I'm gonna have to send you an email to get a link to that. That's fascinating. <laughs> I, uh, I have no I, idea. I I did refer a paper. Unfortunately, it was not accepted in journal where they wanted it, but uh, there is literature out there uh, looking at doing exas on uh, 10, 10, above 10 kV electrons. That's fascinating. Um, okay, uh, uh, Trung Tran, you have a question? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. I just, uh, yeah, yeah. Hi, hi, hello, Zhang Yi. Um, oops. Uh, you're just talking about uh, changing the ang angulars and get a different structure. So I just uh, wonder, is it practical to find the magic angle to, for the CK to deal with the anisotropy? Yeah, there is, there is a magic angle as well. Uh, there's literature out there. How, what, what is the combination of convergence angle, collection angle, uh, where you can uh, integrate over all, um, all, all directions. So that there is out there. Um, there's work by Cecile Bert, who spent a lot of time looking at these magic angle calculations. So if you're interested, just... Uh, but, 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 uh, yeah, how do you think about, or how do you think about, is it, it, do you think it's to, it worth to experimentally find its magic yeah. angle? Yeah, okay. it's to, uh, to, 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 to a wide range of the common. It's important to do it, especially if you look at anisotropic material. So if you, people, for example, would like to know what is the sp2, sp3 fraction by looking at the, the ratio of the pi and sigma star in, on the carbon K edge. And um, 
uh, if you don't use the magic angle, you cannot do it because of the other right. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Fejo, you have a question? Hello, uh, I have a question. Uh, for the really, really high resolution uh, spectroscopy, uh, do you, is, is it similar to the soft X ray, uh, uh, like X ray spectroscopy, you trade the flux uh, for the resolution? Like, you know, if you do really, really high resolution, it's going to be yep. low flux and very slow. Is that, is that, that true? That, that's right. It's the same compromise. You, you disperse the uh, electrons on a dispersing plane with a monochromator, you put a slit to get uh, better, well, energy selection, and then you throw out all the electrons. Then uh, the how, how the small aperture and the larger aperture, the, how the data acquisition time compare? Uh, okay. Um, it's faster than extra absorption. <laughs> oh. So we, the, the example I'm going to give you, we're talking spectra collected in a fraction of a second. Okay. Uh, so these, at the new direct electron detector, I think you can acquire a uh, thousand spectra per second. Obviously there's a question of signal, but uh, with, even with a monochromator at very low energy losses, which I'm not going to cover here. So in the 1.1 EV energy range, uh, you would acquire spectra in 10 to 100 milliseconds max. Wow. With an energy resolution of, of 30 milli electron volts. Okay, thank you. All right, um, uh, we'll hold other questions until the next break. Uh, you should continue, please. All right, thank you. So uh, let's talk about spatially resolved energy loss. So... I don't know what's going on. Right. So in this case, what we need to do is take advantage of these uh, uh, electron um, uh, aberration correction systems that can focus the beam down to sub-angstrom, let's say. Now, I think the system can go to half an angstrom or 0.6 angstrom almost routinely. And uh, so you focus the electron beam down uh, to smaller than the spacing between the atoms. You would have a scattered signal. Uh, so at high angles, which provides information on the atomic number. So this is a uh, high uh, HADF is called high angle anodark dark field. So it's a atomic number contrast. And then obviously uh, with, uh, between the, these, uh, well, between the specimen and the uh, spectrometer, you have multiple lenses, so you can change this collection angle. And then you have spectrometer. Uh, if you have uh, uh, the direct electron detectors, then you would uh, be able to have very good signals, uh, even with a sub-angstrom probe, monochromated probe. And you can, um, these are our first uh, references, which were about the same time as the first, first uh, atomic result maps in the literature. Uh, you can uh, actually map single atom uh, dopants in, in uh, oxide. So these are cerium uh, uh, dopants in, uh, in a superconductor. So, um, and I'm gonna show examples of that. So how we do mapping. So we scan the electron beam, uh, just like you would do in Stixem, you scan in, this, in the Stixem, you scan the sample. Uh, and you get uh, uh, a signal recorded uh, in the detector, and then you build a data cube just like you would do in Stixem, uh, and then you have a, a spectrum at every single uh, uh, X, Y position of your sample. And because you have high uh, spatial resolution, high energy resolution, then you can uh, separate um, transition metal edges uh, or any, any edges. And in this case, uh, for this superconductor here, you can do maps of the lanthanum atom position, copper atom position. Uh, of course, this is not so useful in a perfect crystal, but when you have dopants, you can go and pick up where the cerium atom dopant is. Uh, why do we want to use that? Uh, uh, examples are multilayers, so this heterostructure, barium titanate and strontium titanate multilayers. The Contrast you see here is due to the fact that barium is heavier than strontium. 
So that's where the contrast is in the images. And you can see there's some modulation here. So we did atomic resolved maps, and this is Mathieu who did this work. Uh, and you can see the uh, uniformity of the layer. You can actually see there is diffuse at their interface. Um, of course, we look in, in projection. So there is a question whether it's a chemical diffuse or a roughness uh, induced interface. Uh, but at least you can get this chemical information. You can estimate uh, the diffusiveness uh, of the interface, uh, chemically diffusiveness. The other example is uh, this uh, multiferroic material band, uh, BLTO, uh, where you have lanthanum um, introduced in the system. Uh, you can get beautiful images. Uh, these bright columns are the bismuth atoms. And the question is, well, you can do simulation of the images to actually confirm the structure. And then you can do, uh, you can uh, try to find where the lanthanum goes. Um, and, uh, uh, by mapping, so going to the lanthanum uh, N edge, in this case, not the lanthanum edge, you can see very, very, very clearly that the lanthanum is actually not uniformly distributed, but is actually in only one of these uh, um, uh, layers. So it's a, it's a layer structure, but lanthanum is not randomly distributed. It actually prefers to sit on the bottom one of these two layers here, these uh, rock salt layers, uh, which is, you know, really powerful information. You cannot get it in any other way. Let's go to another uh, other example, uh, functional oxide. These are brown millerites. This is a collaboration with a colleague, John Greeden at McMaster. And uh, the question was, uh, in these complex structure where we have octahedra and tetrahedra, where are the transition metal atoms, iron and manganese or iron and cobalt going? Uh, from neutron and X-ray diffraction uh, refinement, it was this information was actually not conclusive. So what we did is atomic result maps, uh, looking at the calcium, oxygen, iron, and manganese. And when you notice, particularly this manganese atom go on the octahedral layers and the, uh, the iron atoms go to the tetrahedral layer. You can see very clearly the spacing here. The, the, the two atoms are pocket together. They, they, they're close to each other compared to the manganese uh, atom. So you you can do electron energy loss uh, crystallography, I would call this, uh, to solve uh, structures. Uh, and we can, from the valence, inform, from the spectra information, we can get uh, deduce the valence. We have uh, manganese and iron in three plus uh, oxidation state. Then the question we can we de detect differences in the uh, coordination? of these, uh, um, these atoms. So, so what we did is we acquired spectra over this, the area that is shown here. Um, and there we have the octahedral layer and tetrahedral layer simply from the images. And we, if we uh, collect spectra, we, we analyze, we extract spectra from the, the octahedral layers, which are shown in red compared to the tetrahedral layers, which are shown in blue, we do see very fine difference due to the coordination. So the valence state is three plus in both cases, but the coordination is slight, well, is different and slightly, and that induces slight differences in the spectra. And uh, what we, this is not just noise. In fact, you can actually map out the two contributions, the green, sorry, the blue and the red spectra and map them out. So integrate horizontally and you can see that the, distribution of red spectra and blue spectra are anti-correlated with each other. So we are able to deduce uh, atomic location, we can deduce valence, and we can deduce also map out the uh, coordination. Let's go to more example, uh, more uh, other examples in more complex compounds. And it's uh, this is the last stop if you have questions. I don't know, Jerry, do you want to stop here? I think go uh, ahead and uh, uh, let's continue to the end and we'll, sure. uh, we'll hold the questions till then. Yeah, there's uh, just a few slides. So in, in much more interesting and more complex compound, uh, these are being sensitive. So it's, it's a bit of a challenge. So we, we looked at first uh, these, uh, the, the 248 phase of vitrium barium copper oxide. They are superconductors grown by pulse laser deposition. And so what we did was trying to find uh, what is the valence state of copper? What is the chemical bonding environment of, of copper atoms? 
in these uh, these complex structures. So uh, we have the barium map. Uh, so barium atoms very clearly visible. And then instead of plotting uh, the intensity of the edge, we plot the intensity of the uh, the peaks here. So these are this is normal spectrum, and yeah, it, now it's plotted in a temperature scale as a function of position. So the more intense peaks, so these two red uh, areas here correspond to these two peaks here of the barium uh, M edge, M45 edge, okay? So you have the barium planes corresponding to the position where the barium atoms are. So it's integrated horizontally, that's something to keep in mind. And, uh, and then, uh, so the copper oxygen planes are in between the barium uh, planes, okay? Uh, and then uh, we plot the copper signal in 2D, and then we plot it the same way as we plot uh, the barium atoms. And you can see you have the barium planes, a copper plane, a barium plane, a copper plane, and so on. And you notice very clearly that the signature of the copper L edge is different whether you are in these locations here or the, uh, these locations here. Right? So the valence state of copper is changing. I'm going to show them in uh, now in um, in a different way. So we we discriminate now what is copper one plus and copper two plus uh, in a color code scheme, uh, like principal component analysis equivalent. And you can see uh, that there are green planes and then red planes. So we have copper two and copper one. And if you want to extract them to to be convinced, then you can see. Where we have the copper oxygen planes, you have copper four, uh, two plus, and then something in between. And then you have in the chains, you have copper uh, one plus, right? So you are able to resolve individual atomic planes and determine the valence state of the copper atoms. Uh, what was maybe more interesting or more useful was the in investigation of the YBCO, the one, two, three structure with with uh, oxygen doping. So we look at single crystals of uh, oxygen six and oxygen seven. We do the same type of exercise. Uh, this is a bit more noisy. This is a beam sensitive material. So you have to be very careful, work with low dose, uh, but that's the price to pay with <laughs> gaining spatial resolution. So this is the uh, L3 edge. This is the L2 edge, uh, very noisy here, but nevertheless, you do see significant difference between the the planes and the chains, right? Uh, and then between oxygen six and oxygen seven, two different compounds. So we published this in, um, in this paper here. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time except to show the, the, the different spectra extracted from this kind of information uh, from, from this kind of data set. So uh, these are uh, the information on the copper oxygen planes in YBCO seven and six, essentially the same. The copper in those planes remains the same. Uh, in the chains, there is a change uh, in the oxygen, uh, in the copper uh, uh, copper L edge. This is the copper three, this is copper two, L2, L3. Uh, and uh, if you look at an oxygen edge, that's where also it's very interesting. There's a change in the oxygen, uh, K edge, uh, corresponding to the holes in the oxygen six and seven. There's a very different marked difference between the spectra here corresponding to the holes and the same here for the chains. I don't want to talk so much about the, the physical conclusion. These are given in the paper. If you want to go, I think I encourage you to do that. But it really shows the power of the technique going to basically uh, uh, atomic plane result. I think this is with the new detectors you could do, you could probably go and look at the apical oxygen and find what is the chemical environment that changes in the environment of the apical oxygen. So no, more, no longer integration horizontally. We have another compound uh, that is uh, um, of the similar nature. Um, and uh, this is, a, it's called a, a chain ladder compound where we have uh, copper oxygen chains and, and uh, copper oxygen ladders. So these are two dimensional, this is one dimensional. Uh, we can do very nice uh, maps showing where the copper atoms, uh, the calcium atoms are. That's uh, a single crystal, so it's maybe not surprising. 
However, if you look at the sum of valence uh, here, you look at positive charge and negative charges corresponding to this chemical formula here, we do have a, a, a gap of six uh, holes. And what we what do we see on the oxygen K edge? We do see two features, one corresponding to the holes, uh, the presence of holes. This is known from X-ray absorption. It's, uh, it's not a, a new type of information. And then corresponding to this peak here, the Albert energy, this is the electron-electron interaction. And now you can guess where I'm going. Uh, we did this uh, special resolve looking at the, uh, the peaks corresponding to the holes and to the Albert peak. And you see there's a difference, right? So we can conclude and even quantitatively that we have uh, twice as many holes in the chains compared to the ladders. You see, these are two different orientations. And this is because of this uh, anisotropy. We, we did investigate these effects as a function of uh, angular conditions and orientation. You can see the, the measurements are consistent with each other. So uh, these are put into context of uh, other measurements which are all over the place. So they, 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 we have here the uh, calcium 11 uh, uh, composition here, which is this line, vertical line, and indirect measurements all over the place. And because you cannot spatially resolve them and you have to deduce, make deduction indirectly, but we, we did make a measurement uh, and we actually have an error bar on, on that. And I think that was the last example. I, I because of time, I I'm not going to show lithium-ion batteries work. They, I give some references here. Um, they are given also in the abstract. I encourage you to see them. But because of time, I prefer to uh, finish the presentation here. If you have a, I can talk about outlook later if you have uh, more time. But I want to simply uh, provide a, a summary. Uh, I could talk about the future later if there are questions. Uh, so energy loss and uh, in electron microscope is very powerful for lots of applications from fundamental studies or superconductors to engineering applications. I didn't spend so much time talking about all sorts of applications we worked on over the years, but uh, I would still say uh, that there is actually no single technique that has the answer and uh, I'm starting to use X absorption and we see the power of the combination of techniques. There's, there's no way that you can just use one and get everything. Um, it complements very well uh, X absorption for dilute materials and dynamic studies. Uh, we do want to look at uh, in operando or in situ conditions. That can only be done uh, with uh, X absorption. We've done work in liquids, in liquid cell, and it really doesn't work. I can tell you that. Uh, the sample, uh, electron sample interaction are very important. Uh, a lot of the cases, and if not, I would say almost, almost almost all the cases, we do suffer electron beam damage. So we need to find ways around it or uh, basically use other techniques. And um, so the message is that it's important to use the best technique that is relevant to the process um and uh it's not because it looks good that it's actually the right answer okay on that i want to thank uh past uh, and, and current students at mcmaster who've done all the work i uh and i've shown here and beyond uh my colleagues at mcmaster i interacted uh um, over the years uh julian goward on the work on batteries but adam Itchcock on many different areas um, work from collaborators at GATAN, uh, uh, at FEI and funding, and also other collaborators at, uh, um, around the world who have provided the samples that I discussed here and we worked on over the years. On that, I think I'll stop um, if there are questions. Definitely there's questions and there'll be more. People should be typing them into the chat. Thank you, it was a wonderful seminar. Um, uh, I'll start off with uh, a couple of questions. Um, what's the biggest practical limitation to getting a study done, 
right? If you can measure stuff in, in under a second, there's 3,600 seconds in an hour. And, uh, uh, and yet the experiment, of course, is so hard that you don't get through 3,600 experiments in an hour. That's so, right. you know, w w when you go and do an experiment, what's the thing that makes it take six hours to get everything right and set up to get your 10 milliseconds of data? Yeah, so the, you say, a map like those ones I showed you, the barium titanate, might take a, a few minutes, right? Uh, and that's it. But to get to the, the preparation of the sample is, I would say, the most uh, uh, stringent and most challenging requirement. Sure, but that's and offline. That's before it gets into the electron microscope. Yeah. Okay. okay, keep going. Uh, so, but still, uh, the sample need to be good, right? It's not simply I'm going to thin them and put them in a the microscope and going to get something. The the quality of the sample, more than I think many techniques, really affects the quality of the results. If the sample is a bit thicker, you don't see anything, <laughs> nothing. Uh, so these are uh, challenges. The alignment of the microscope, I would say, is still uh, something that um, it's becoming easier. Alignment of monochromators becoming automated. But um, so, uh, yeah, uh, alignment, getting, tuning the microscope is an issue. Once the sample is done, it's not, uh, you put it in and you get a result all the time. You, you will have, I'm, we have some students working on samples now. Then the sample is done and then you put it in and you just drill holes <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> So every sample is a new experience uh, and every sample needs to be investigated, understood. What are the limitations for that particular samples? And some samples uh, we are never gonna be able to study because of the electron beam damage, right? So I'm, I'm very realistic uh, with this. I mean, I obviously shown all the things that work. Uh, there's lots of things that don't work as well. I understand. Okay, uh, Satish, you have a question? Uh, yeah, um, uh, thank you for a very nice talk. And you showed these beautiful uh, atomic scale maps of different elements in you know varieties of material. So my question is, is it possible to make similar maps using changes in uh, near edge spec uh, spectra? To, like, to... For example, like you know, looking at changes in bonding environments and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I did show them. Um... The, the the copper, I mean, it, the, we have two dimensional maps. I didn't show them, but I think, uh, yeah, the answer is yes. You can do, you can just focus on the changes of the fine structure and do a two dimensional map. Yes, so we can do that. Uh, I didn't show them, but it's possible. I think the examples I have are not as exciting, but uh, um, that's the one I've shown you. Uh, but yes, you can. The same as, uh, sticks and focusing on one particular component and then mapping them out. Uh, yes, if you look at the reference I've given on the batteries, we did do mapping, two-dimensional mapping on near edge structures. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Earlier you said that uh, the stability of the beam is not that good. If that is the case, then how well we can map, uh, you know, the bonding environments over like, I don't know, maybe an hour or two in a sample. Yeah, as experiments, the last one or two hours, is, it's really not. Uh, these these acquisitions last a few minutes and it's stable ah, enough see. to do I this. See. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh, it used to be an issue. Uh, I would say very early on, it's no longer an issue. I Stability. See. I mean, That's it can great. be, but there, there are ways, you know, you can also, there are algorithms where now you have the zero loss peak and the core loss peak. Uh, you, you acquire one and the other one. So the, you can align always the spectrum to the zero loss peak. So you can have even hours if you need to be acquiring because of the, the ways that you, you can do acquisitions. So I, I wouldn't say it's a problem anymore. Thank you. Okay, just two more questions. First, um, uh, uh, in X-ray Raman scattering, which is like eels, but with photons, um, uh, uh, you have, uh, uh, there's a lot of work that looks at momentum transfer dependence and whatnot to try and uh, impose different selection rules. Um, what's your feeling about uh, the, the feasibility of that? 
uh, on solids, that is. We've done it in gases with Adam uh, in solids um, to try and uh, play with different selection rules at the core level. Right, it's the Q. You've been using the direction of Q in that matrix element. The question is, what about the magnitude? Yeah, the magnitude will decrease as Q4 with a new detection I mentioned before. No, no, I mean in the matrix element, you have oh, a, a Q, Q dot R. So if Q is large, your selection rule changes. Yeah. Has that been uh, used much in EELS? No, it hasn't been used. There's some work in the literature looking at these forbidden transitions. Uh, and I think because people sort of avoided them or they didn't have the technology to measure them, they're sort of not being used, but there, there are some effects where you can see these forbidden transitions uh, now with the new detectors because you can avoid, you can uh, go around the selection rules for optical transitions by going to a high uh, momentum uh, transfer. So um, I think it needs, people to do and as uh, people say a lot uh, people are starting with the low-hanging fruits first uh, so I would say it just takes people who want to do this okay and last question from Trung Tran uh, yes uh, yes and it, it, I'm pleased to see the, the atomic uh, mapping with uh, when you are showing the the map of the lantern energy yes yeah, the um, it, it was a bit surprised for me that, that it's not so delocalized, not so spatial. I was so just wondering that the, the signals were integrated pretty far from the, from the onset. Which edge? The, um, uh, the lantern N edge? Yeah, I saw one of the slides in, in the mapping. Um, uh, was the, the, N, the N edge? Is that what you say? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so the, the N edges are atomic result, they're not as uh, um, easy to interpret. In fact, uh, if you, we did some work uh, on atomic resolved um, maps of uh, cerium hexaboride, and we look at the cerium map uh, on the, the N edge and the uh, M edge, and they're different. The one, the N edge, has a hole in the middle where the atom is. The intensity goes That's down. Right. Yeah. We do have that. It's, uh, it's not on one of the reference I provided, but we, this was the first time uh, we had clear evidence of this uh, uh, non, uh, you know, non trivial. So normally you would expect the intensity of a, in a map of an atom would be the maximum within the center of the atom. But in fact, it's actually dipping down like a volcano. Um, we see that effect. Uh, uh, you, I think, um, yeah, in the references, if you look back at my presentation, uh, yeah. uh, let me just see if I... Yeah, yeah, I, 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 think, I think that's right about, uh, the, uh, there are some, some simulation from uh, Scott Finlay, so... Yeah, that's right. Uh, but that's uh, right. we have, uh, uh, if you look at uh, one of these papers here, I, for, I think it's the second one, the microscopy yeah. microanalysis. Uh, you actually see that evidence uh, experimental. The, the calculations are, you know, the calculations. Uh, so it's easy to, well, it's easy. They're not easy calculation. What I mean, the theoretically, it's easy to see them. Experimentally, you need to have a good signal. So if you look at, at this uh, Lazar and al uh, in microscopy microanalysis, we do see the hole in the middle of the atom for oh, NH. Yes. That, that experimentally convincing already for me. I saw it already. So it, um, uh, I just, because I just, it just brought out the wonder because I saw one of your slides of the, uh, the map of lanternum and NH. So I just wonder because it's impossible to get the atomic without a hole inside because you just move pretty far away from the onset. It, it really it's depends. More look like then, yes. Yeah, actually, it depends of the uh, the angular conditions. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It depends of the angular conditions. Uh, yeah, so you can, one, yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. So it, if you look at the the paper, you will find it. Uh, so it, it's really angular dependent. Depends of the the angular. Uh, the, the beta collection angle when you acquire the maps. Yeah. Yes, the hole in the middle of the atom, like uh, just due to the radius of the n of the n shell. Is that what you're seeing? 
There's also the, it's the scattering, uh, including the nucleus. That uh -huh. uh, yeah. So those are the things that count. Uh, I think you probably need to look at the references of um, uh, the theoretical reference. So I think in our paper we do make reference, not this paper here, but the one of uh, uh, this one here. Uh, we do make reference to the calculation where this would be considered. All right, thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. It was a wonderful seminar and uh, gives us all a lot to think about. Uh, whether it's experiments we now want to do in an electron beam instead of a photon beam, or thinking about how to bring the, uh, the best together of synchrotron capabilities, high brilliance synchrotron capabilities, and astonishing brilliance electron microscopy capabilities, and uh, has given us, uh, given us all a lot to think about.